Was this Milano Sanremo as boring as you thought it would be? No. Was the Poggio descent of Mathieu van der Poel better than the descent of Matej Mohoric last year? No. Did you expect more of Tadej Pogacar? No. Is Remco Evenepoel able to win La Primavera one day? Uh, no. Did a mainstream pick win Milano Sanremo? Yes. I've got the sparse, the sickness, there's the twins in my brain. The first monument of the season is in the bag of Mathieu van der Poel. The 250 kilometers after the start were as hard as the beginning of a new working week, but the final had everything you wanted it to have as a cycling fan. The world's best riders battling it out for the win. I'm your host again for this episode, with two domestiques joining me today, Bram and Eve. Ready, Hello. Think? Bram, was this one was this one of the best Milano Sarimo editions you've ever seen? Um it's difficult to say. Um, I, I remember a couple of really good ones, uh, but yeah, having four guys really battle it out like that on the pocho is great. I think I would have preferred to have seen a, a bit longer fight, maybe the Fipressa as well, but hey, we can't complain with what we got. This was quite of a historical week for Domestic Cycling Podcast, wasn't it? Um, yeah, uh, we reached uh, 19,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, and we also uh, have now 1,000 uh, monthly downloads for our podcast, so that is really cool. That's a nice, fun milestone to reach. If I'm going to give you your moment of fame already. As a Mathieu van der Poel and a Shari Bosait fanboy, you must be feeling over the moon. Yeah, my weekend can't be better than it is right now. Um, but besides the two beautiful winners, um, we saw some crazy racing and very entertaining racing. I think this Milano San Remo, or at least from the, the Poggio, it was really entertaining. Uh, a lot of guys could win when they started the Poggio, uh, but when the, the, the big guns uh, reached the front, uh, we witnessed cycling magic. Still. Am I correct when saying you weren't really convinced Van der Poel was going to do this before the race? Well, um, in our fantasy game, um, I had Van der Poel in my team, but I had Pogacar as well. Um, I was doubting quite a bit about who would be my leader. Um, I decided to pick Pogacar um, because the Strade Bianchi from Mathieu just wasn't good enough yet. Yes, it was his first race of the season, of course. Uh, but then the week uh, after, uh, in Terreno Adriatico, I expected maybe a bit more performance-wise uh, from Mathieu. But he just played it very cool there and just saw it as an extra week of training. He did some uh, two crazy leaders for Philipson, of course, but that's like only a couple of kilometers when he's at, in the front. So uh, I gambled, but I took the wrong leader and yeah. After all, it must be pretty hard for you as a non-mainstream picker, because it was a mainstream pick who won the race. Yeah, it was. it's always quite easy to say a Van der Poel, a Van Aert, a Bukacar will win Milan Sarimo will win a monument. Um, those guys are on a different level uh, in comparison to the others. But I think uh, my pick, Søren Krah Andersen, in the, in the preseason uh, predictions, uh, did a very good job. Um, he helped Mathieu when the Tim Balance Pogacar attack went. Uh, Søren Krah Andersen was the one who gap who tried to chase them back first so that Mathieu didn't have to waste too much energy. And my other pick, Magnus Kurt Nielsen, ended up in 14th. It's not the best, but it's still top 20, top 15. So, but yeah, the best one 
and the best four or five uh, were at the front, the best four. It might be an interesting way to start this episode by discussing our pre-season and pre-race picks. And as you say, Søren Kran Andersen, you've been saying it before the season that this was going to be his race, and kudos to you. Um, I doubted it, even last week, and he was one of the strongest domestiques in the race, really. Congratulations on that one. Thank you very much. Um, Bram, your pick was a little worse. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Arnold de Lee um, ended up in 95th place, and <laughs> when I saw him being dropped on the first slopes of Gipresa, I had to think about you. How is your how is your feeling about him? Um, I, I think I don't quite understand what Lada Destiny was doing. Maybe it was his own decision because uh, before the race they were uh, saying uh, on the top of the podium they need to have the strategy uh, clear if they're going for Ewan or for Deli. Uh, but if Deli basically storms up to the front of the peloton with Ewan in his wheel and then sits up it was pretty clear that uh, that decision had already been made. Um, maybe to leave just during the race, I'd already said, I don't have the legs today uh, and decided to do a little bit of domestic work, which is commendable for him. Uh, in the end, he did start as one of the shadow favorites. So probably the 300 kilometers mark was a little above him. Yeah, yet. I mean, he's 21. Um, I think it is one of those races where he can win uh, in the future. Um and I think he believes that as well. Uh, but yeah, not this year. I think this year we saw a, a very fast edition of Milano Sanremo. Um, the early break received only three minutes or less. Um, when we listened to some experts, it was because of the the tailwind. Um, mm. They didn't want to risk them too much pace, but that creates a, a very fast pace in the bunch for seven hours so the belgian commentator michel waits even said afterwards that it uh, might have been the second fastest edition ever <laughs> i don't know if that's true but he mentioned it um having seen the performance of the lee in san remo does that change your opinion about him at gent wevel again no i think uh, they're two very different races um so, yeah, the, but San Remo, you have that really long build-up where, you know, maybe lactic acid gets into your legs in that 250 kilometers before the the copy, and then suddenly you hit the copy and you're like, wait, what's going on with my legs? I don't have, like, they're not functioning as they should do. Um, the Gentry of Gem is a much, uh, well, you have constant racing going on. Uh, you're always getting your leg, your legs activated. Uh, so that's quite a different race. And I don't think you would have that same issue. I don't know how, how he's scheduling his season. Like he is a very, he started very good um, early on in this season. And he showed some great form in Omelope at Nysblad and Kuhn uh, um, He wasn't able to win or compete for the win in Paris where he participated. Um, yeah. And positioning the, the positions of the sprint train were troubles as well, but now he dropped very fast on the Cipresa. Um is he peaking towards Handwevenham or is his first peak already over? Is that a possibility as well? I think he has a very full calendar uh coming yeah, up exactly. over the next couple of months. So I don't know if it's maybe it was his first peak. Um in a recent interview, he did say that over the the longer term, so maybe not this year, uh, that he's really trying to go for races like Perry Roubaix or the Tour of Flanders. Um, I don't think he's riding the Tour of Flanders this year, but he is I, riding I Roubaix. I don't think so, but when I checked his, his schedule, I think there was Gent Wevelgem, Duarte of Vlaanderen, and even the Brabant Sepel was on there. So, yep. That's, and then, uh, that's pretty tough. A couple of races in France as well. Uh, yeah. So... Yeah, he's got a very full schedule. Uh, but then again, he's uh, the main points taker for Lotto Destiny. Would it still be in their mind? Uh, do you, you see points? After what happened to... last year? I think so. I think they're they, playing the long game. They want to get in the World Tour again 
uh, within the three years. So when the uh, classifications are made up at that point, but I don't know why would you make the schedule of such a young talent and guy so busy so early on in the season? Like with only only March, he already he already has a lot of race days, and it's only getting more and more. Uh, I'm going to assume their performance game? staff. I'm assuming uh, their perform their performance staff knows what they're doing. Um, so, I think so far the team is doing a great job. Milan Menten yeah. won as well, so yeah, the team the- is doing a great job. But I get the feeling like I had last year with Pitcock with a very busy schedule that he's you will never be able to have that top top fitness peak. That he needs to win a big class. That he needs to win a big classic or a monument, even. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the only monument he had the opportunity for this year, I feel, was Milano Sanremo. I don't think he's gonna uh, be there at uh, Perubé. I am prepared to eat humble pie if he does. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the the full schedule. I think he just feels that like he can manage it. Um, but we'll see. Time All right. Um, moving on to Josh's pick, which we didn't even remember uh, the past uh, episode. <laughs> he picked Wait, um, wh- which Caleb one was Ewan it? preseason. All oh, right. <laughs> and in fact, that wasn't so bad. In no, but yeah, he finished sixteenth. He climbed very good on the Cipresa, I think, where he was at the front. Um, at the beginning um, and then on the Poggio he just, yeah it was a big long line um, whereby the way Trentins played a strategic masterclass just breaking uh, up that line but Ewan didn't win the, the chasing group sprint after that as well, I don't know if it's motivational or just the legs but he was there and the league couldn't even lead out him Um, I don't know if we need to talk about my preseason pick, um, Biniam Girmay. He was still there on uh, on the Poggio, but when um, yeah, the bunch uh, split it because of Matteo Trentin, yeah, he never really saw the front of the race again. He ended up in 28th place, and yeah, somehow I don't have the feeling he's as strong as he was last year. But then again, all of a sudden he won Gent Wevelgem, so. I don't know what to think about him. He was in the same group as uh, Ewan, so and he didn't even go for a sprint. He just sat up in the back and didn't contest it. Um, the, the team says that they're not worried about his shape, that they're still building, uh, but it does seem quite odd that uh, such an up-and-coming talent that he was last year, and he still is, that he's not fighting for big wins right now. Um, I do hope to see him more in the, in the Flemish uh, classics or the cobble classics in general because uh, in the end that's where he's got his first major victory so maybe that's just what suits him more exactly you will know more in about a week let's move over to the pre-race picks if you already mentioned um, Magnus Kort who ended up in 14th place but I was even more impressed by his teammate Nielsen Paulus was an impressive yeah. ride or is his, uh, his season start has been ex- exceptionally strong. He won several races, won one or two general classifications in smaller stage races. Um, yeah, Paul is... Uh, I think he had his first pro win last year in the Japan Cup, if I recall correctly. Um, but last year he showed himself already in Tour de France. Um, and he became famous when he tried to counter the... Uh, he tried to follow the move on Remco Evenepoel in liege Bastoni liege last year, where both his wheels were off the ground, I think, when we saw that picture. Yep, that's um, right. But Paulus is really becoming a very strong rider in the pro peloton. And he's part of your uh, wheeler manager, if I, if I recall correctly. Yeah, yeah, he is. Um, <laughs> He's riding the Dwarsdorf Vlaanderen, Ronde van Vlaanderen, and then going to the to the Hilly Classic. So he's riding quite a lot 
of races that are within our fantasy game and he wasn't that expensive so I, I took the gamble and he already gave me some points in a race I didn't really expect him to take that amount yeah, of points it's a great pick um, Bram uh, we'll skip your pick uh, for a moment let's move on to Josh's pick first Jonathan <laughs> Milan he was a domestic for Mohoric so yeah he he never really had a chance I mean, I think it was mainly due to the illness that he got during Paranis. Uh, and apparently Josh didn't catch that, uh, that he abandoned in the last stage, I believe. Um, so, yeah. I mean, in but, good health, Jonathan Milan should be able to at least be in the third group uh, with Ewan and uh, Philipson and Magnus Kort. I think he would belong to be in that group. Maybe he could be in the group before that I don't think he would have gone with uh, the top four to be honest if you see how the race yesterday evolved Jonathan Milan could have never played the major role in that race in my opinion I don't think so either no H top 10 maybe but that's his weight it. is a huge disadvantage and when the big guns explode then yeah yeah, I mean, I there, there were two of... guys on the, the podium that have quite a bit of weight on them, uh, especially the Italian, uh, Filippo Ghana. But I think Milan is even... It's different, I think. I think he's he carries a little bit more kilos. Um, he's a very strong. I think I, his absolute watts from Jonathan Milan are insane. Um, remember last year, I don't know where it was, Tour of Denmark... Uh, where uh, Vinigard was fighting a young guy from the SN. And the Crow Milan... Race. Yeah, the Crow Race, uh, where Milan just tried to stay with a front group with the 50 kilo climbers on a very steep hill. That was really impressive, but uh, he needs to lose some weight, or I don't know what he will. Is he a pure sprinter, or is he still it's uncertain what he's going to be oh, he's according gonna be to pro cycling stats he's 84 kilos for 1 meter 94 uh, which means he's 1 centimeter taller than Filippo Ghana and 1 uh, kilogram heavier alright that's surprising Oof. so they're very similar um, I'll, the last yeah. episode I dropped the name of Tim Valens uh, back then he wasn't even on the start list but Brave Due to some changes, he was uh, at the start, and he did a great job as a domestique for uh, Tim Wellens, setting a very, very high pace on the Poggio. So, after all, I think it was a good choice. Choice. Um, Wellens did a great job, but yeah, yeah, it was the scenario becoming, uh, I had in mind. He's basically becoming Pogacar's leadout guy. Uh, he did very similar things in uh, the Ruta del Sol as well. So, yeah, he's becoming the Pogacar leader. And I got to admit, and Eve, you won't like it, I think, but I'm turning into a fan of Tim Valens uh, the last few weeks. The way he's riding, it's it's completely different than he did at, at uh, Lotto Sudal at the time. So, yeah, yeah. I, I like to see him. I can com I completely agree. Um, Tim Mellens is a completely different rider in comparison to the rider he was when he was in Lotto. Um, he even has a different air around him. It's some fresh air and other training methods. Um, a very good leader within the team helps as well. And he gets his own chances, like in the opening weekend, like his stage when in Ruta del Sol. And then in other races, he just the the best domestique for Pogacar at the moment, I think, within UAE. So yeah, I can completely agree with the fact that Valens becomes more likable. Do you think there's a chance that Valens will get some freedom in the Flemish classics uh, with Pogacar in the team, or will he be a a full domestique? He will get freedom, I think. Yeah, I think he can operate as a satellite rider, and even if Pogacar never bridges over, then he will be able to to get his own chance. 
Like, I think for him to not be the leader of the team is, is super important. And that's sort of what makes him race. Well, he can do more of, well, he, he doesn't have that pressure on him that he's always had at Lotto where he had to do it. Uh, now he can just, uh, well, do a different job. I think in Sanremo, Sanremo isn't there a race where there are a lot of different race strategies involved. It's like you base a little bit on Cipressa with the team, but now there was headwind, so there couldn't be made a lot of uh, uh, riders ride, ride just dropped. But like uh, when you have the Flemish hills, it's a uh, all different race, all different mindset. You can anticipate, and that's something you can do in Milan Sarim. All right. Um, Bram, last week you dropped the name Wout van Aert for the win of uh, Milan San Remo. Or, yeah, were I, you happy I, with it, or, or did you think he was going to be stronger than what we saw of him? No, I, I think it was sort of... T- well, he was at the level where I think he would be at. Um, you just had one guy who was clearly stronger and then Philip Pagana I think who uh, in the chase behind didn't give it his all and, and sort of waited for a sprint um, although there are also questions about uh, what's gearing choices in the descent maybe he uh, bottomed out on his gears and wasn't able to to really push um, but yeah I, I got accused for getting a mainstream pick and then another mainstream <laughs> pick one so you know <laughs> you're not over it no <laughs> um talking about that descent i think Wout van Aert put a lot of pressure on uh, philip ugana he who had to close yeah 10 or 20 meters uh, a couple of times so yeah i i can't see the problem with that descent actually i think that was mainly after the corners um Wout and Mathieu are both great bike handlers uh, coming out of side cross. Um, Philippe Pogana probably isn't as great of a bike handler uh, coming out of track cycling. Um, so maybe that's just that uh, those two were taking a bit bigger risks in the turns uh, with us not having motorbikes uh, on the road this year in the descent. We didn't really see that up close, uh, but on the heli shots, you definitely saw that after corners uh, well, it's kept getting a, a small gap on Philip Pagana. If I want to drop a, a quote of yours from the last episode, then you said, Poggio isn't hard enough for Pogacar to create major gaps. And I think that's exactly what we saw. Yeah, I, that will be the most difficult part for Pogacar to win Milan Sarimo. Um the Poggio is a climb that hurts the legs after 300 kilometers of racing, but the, the gradients aren't very high to drop riders more than 10 or 20 meters. Yes, Mathieu van der Poel did, but it wasn't really on the Poggio climb. It was like more on the, on the top going into the descent, just the last 200 meters. And that was like more. Van der Poel has always been a very explosive rider and Pogacar is explosive as well, but he misses that extra punch on a 5 or 6% climb. The guy was totally on his limit when you saw that yeah. last couple of hundred meters. He wasn't really able to sprint. No, Wout van Aert wasn't either, but it shows how strong Van der Poel was and, and what a hard final it has been. Yeah. It was, yeah. I still look back at those last 10, 15 kilometers and it's, it was a phenomenal piece of racing from those guys. It went so hard, so fast. You couldn't even see they were going uphill. I wish I could ride that fast in a descent, but they are just exceptional. Um, one of the past days, I noticed an article in which Pogacar said that San Remo is the most difficult monument for him to win. Do you guys agree with that? I want to see him at Paris-Roubaix first, I think. Yeah. 
I, I actually think if Pogacar wants to win uh, Milan Saremo, he has to change his strategy. I don't think he has to attack over the top and go solo. He has a very strong sprint after a long race. Uh, we know that. I think he but, can follow and actually but he win wasn't a able group to sprint, sprint yesterday. Yeah, because he put everything into making a break on the Poggio and not succeeding. I kind of want to see him just sitting in a group of 10 and sort of doing what he did to win Liège. Uh, I think that's going to be... Uh, I think he can win it that way. He doesn't have to go solo. But like, if he, di if he didn't do the job he did yesterday, we can maybe say the second group with Mats Pedersen would be with them. There will be a couple of fast men then surviving the Poggio if no one does what Pogacar does. Because I, what would Van der Poel and Van Aert do if Pogacar doesn't attack on the Poggio? Everyone expected Pogacar to attack. Mm -hmm. That's one of what those would... things where uh, Pogacar being there is so great for Van der Poel and Van Aert because they can try and follow and then have a really small group towards the line or attack themselves. Uh, they don't have to deal with the fastest men, although they are both equally, or both fast men themselves. I don't think Wout van Aert would have a problem with um, Tadej Pogacar not attacking, because he mainly wants to follow uh, the first rider to the line and then have a sprint, which is tricky. Um, but still, I think Van der Poel would attack if he's able to. Yeah, I don't know. It's everyone was expecting Bogacar to go. He went, but I'm trying to think about the fact if Bogacar doesn't do it, what should happen now? Yeah, it's always if, if, if. I know, but Bogacar... maybe maybe someone like Ala Philippe goes. I don't think he had the likes for it this year, um, but in the past he's always been one to say. On the Padre, I'll go for it. You always yeah. have that every year. There's always someone who wants it. But didn't Van der Poel say that this was his plan? To attack on top of Poggio? Yeah, he did. I think that's also based on the plan from Pogacar. To attack on the Poggio. And then basically, Van der Poel's plan is to counter Pogacar. So, but it's a good plan. I don't know. I think if Pogacar doesn't do it, we'll see... Maybe a surprising winner because then you have maybe a certain Graham Anderson who can sneak away, and Van der Poel says no, he's my teammate, and the others say I'm not chasing him because he isn't a big leader within a team, so it always gets a little bit more of freedom in comparison and to. It. You would also have the likes of uh, Mas Pedersen at the front. Yep. So yeah, I don't, I wouldn't want to go to the line with him after such a race. Um. When Valens and Pogacar accelerated, there was one rider stuck on the wheel of Pogacar, Filippo Ghana. On a scale of zero to crazy, how do you rate his performance? Crazy? But not completely unexpected, I think. Explain. I think we saw Ghana... Uh... Two years ago in the jail, where he climbed very strong, um, he proved there he's more than a pure time trialist. He's more than a track rider. He's a very complete light rider. Then last year he had some troubles with illness and other stuff. Um, I think two years ago he showed he can climb um, the five to six percentage climbs suit him very well because he can push a very high number of watts very high number of power um, and the, the effort on the Poggio is just within his capabilities um, in terms of duration and length I think yeah you say it's not unexpected but did you really expect him to follow Pogacar when the guy attacked, like even Van Aert had to close a few meters, but he was on the wheel 
all the time. Yeah, that's true. But when we look back at the moment before Trentin played that strategic masterclass, it was one big line. Uh-huh. So when Trentin doesn't do it, there is a possibility the group on top of the Pojo will be bigger than it was now. Because now I think it was uh, Kosnifro and the wheel of Trentin. Um, we just didn't have the legs or didn't want to jump across to the first group. But like when you're sitting in the draft, I think it makes a lot of difference. You had to you need to remember Wout van Aert was quite in a bad position at the moment. Tim Wellens, um, he was the last guy in his front of Trentin, I think. So he had to do a big effort to get towards Pogacar. And if you can remain in the draft right from the gun, I think it's a difference. Also, uh-huh. they went uh, up uh, 40 kilometers per hour. So yeah. at 40 kilometers per hour, there's quite a bit of drafting. Yeah. There is one question that came into my mind when I look back at the final kilometers. I was thinking, what if Tom Pitcock was there? We'll never know, of course. But th- that could have made a big difference. Oh, Having... It's so hard to say with Pitcock because you never know what Tom Pitcock you're getting. And this is the third episode in a row where I'm saying this, but I think you just never know. Yeah. If but he has still, the having, next... having two teammates in that Jason group, that's a difference. But would he have been in that first group? Yeah, that's the I question. Think that's we'll what, never that's know what the you, answer. You never know with Pitcock because in Stradi Bianchi had some incredible legs. But then in Tirino Adriatico, he said nope. Maybe he saw it just as training, of course, and he had um, two nasty crashes as well. But you never know before a race starts which version of Pitcock you will get. That's right. But before the race, you said there was only one rider who was able to follow Mohoric in a descent like he did last year, and that would be Tom Pitcock. True. So, if he had been in that chasing group, what then? Yeah, of course. Yeah. We'll, we'll never know. Um, It was also Jumbo Visma's plan to have two riders over the top of uh, the Pojo, but the crash of Tratnik, um yeah, changed that plan because Laporte had to work before he was supposed to work. And that's where the plan failed, I think. I think you you should say that again. Because in the upcoming part of the season, you will not be able to say a lot that Jumbo's tactics felt. I think they will learn a lot from this. They had bad luck as well with Tratnik. But um, yeah, can you can you say it failed because of being, bad luck? Being it didn't work out. Mom. I mean, if you're basically your second guy crashes and is not able to be at the front of the group, he was. I don't know which position he finished or if he even finished at all. Um, but that's basically like asking um, a sprint if a sprinter is lead out guy crashes and then the sprinter is nowhere to be found in the the final result is that a, a tactical error of the team no it's just your lead out guy crash and you have no way of moving up the peloton that's how i see that if i see you thinking uh, i think laporte is more the lead out guy in this scenario um and Laporte should have been closer to Wout. I yeah, think. but the plan was that Tratnik was yeah, going but... to to bring Laporte and Van Aert at the foot of Poggio, and then they and... both had to get over the top with the first riders. Yeah, but Laporte had to uh, help Van Aert positioning, but he didn't really have to be at the front of the pellet in pacing. So... We could have expected more from a good Laporte, but he has been ill as well because he didn't start Paris-Nice. Um, yeah, it, you can say Jumbo's plan failed and they had some bad luck, but still from a team like Jumbo, 
their second rider should be closer to their leader. Uh -huh. All right. If you, as the Mathieu van der Poel expert, is this the best version of van der Poel we're able to see? I don't know. Van der Poel is a guy he says who so. can... Yeah, I know, but it's so weird to see a rider like Van der Poel, the way he's loading himself up for a big race, uh, like the Worlds in Hoogerheide, now Mil Milano Sanremo. Remember, Sanremo was a very big target for Alpecin. Um, they even mentioned that at the start of the season. And he can just peak so extremely strong to one day. It's like, it's calculated to, into the perfection. Like, I need to be ready on the 18th of March. March, And everything that happens before that, I don't care. Is this the 100% Van der Poel? Yeah. <laughs> That's a story we've heard before, isn't it, Bram? <laughs> Yeah, sounds familiar. <laughs> Remco <laughs> Evenepoel. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if Van der Poel peaked towards uh, San Remo, which he did, what consequences that will have for Tour of Flanders and Roubaix? None, I think. Yeah, I don't think it's going to impact it that much. Is he They're able pretty to, keep, close. to keep this for, what is it, three weeks, four weeks? I think it's a very smart decision from him to not start in Hand Wilhelm on Sunday. He's doing the E3 uh, Saxo Classic Friday. Is he doing Gwas der Vlaanderen? Uh, he is doing... Uh, he, no, it's not on his schedule. So is he doing E3 Saxo Classic, Ronde van Vlaanderen and Roubaix? Yeah. So he's only doing those three races. And I think with the form he he has now... He can keep that till Roubaix. Uh -huh. All right. Um, let's get back to the start of this this episode. I ask you the question, Eve: Is Remco Evenepoel able to win Milano Sanremo? And you said no. Can you explain he, that? He has the same issue Pogacar has. The Pojo isn't hard enough. And his downhill capabilities will not be strong enough to win Milan Sanremo. So, Filippo Ganna will never win Milan Sanremo? No. Bram, yeah. as the Remco Evenepoel expert, <laughs> bring it on. I don't think I'm the Remco Evenepoel expert, but apparently I am on this podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things, I think if... If he wants to win this race, and I know I've said this before, Remco can win the races he wants to win. Um, but it, Remco is more than just a climber. He has this huge TT engine, uh, which someone like Filippo Ghana has as well. Filippo Ghana is second this year. To say that that means that Filippo Ghana can never win Milan Sanremo, I think if you can come second in a race, you can win the race. Um, and with Remco, we don't know. Of course, he's never ridden it. Um, but I think if he uh, wins Lombardy this year, he might make it a target uh, if he also wants to go for the for multiple monuments. Well, he always said that he's going to focus on Grand Tours for a couple of years now. And then later on, he'll move the focus to Classics. So I think if he really focuses on it, he's able to win it. I'm I'm actually convinced about that. And if I know we already discussed that at the Brabant Appel last year, where I said that Remco Evenepoel was able to win all five monuments if he wants to. But on this day, you're still not believing me. How? Oh, um, Remco is an exceptional rider. But on terms of bike handling skills, he's not one of the top riders. And to win a Ronde van Vlaanderen and a Paris-Roubaix, you need to have the legs, you need to 
have some luck, but you need to be able to handle your bike very good. And I think real cobble classics will be an issue for Remco Evenepoel. He has the calm on the move, so he is able to ride some cobbles. That being said, of course, during a, a real spring classic, it is different. You have to maneuver yourself to the front. Uh, I don't think he's going to take the risk for a couple of years uh, because he wants to focus on those Grand Tours. But if you see now Pogacar doing it, I think somewhere deep down inside, Remco will feel, okay, if Pogacar can do it, I can do it too. Um, and he'll also want to make the trip. Well, I really hope this podcast will still exist um, in uh, 10 years. <laughs> so we can talk about that uh, once again. If you who, wanted to add something to that. Who will be able to win the first five monuments? Earliest. Can Van der Poel win the five monuments? Okay, I'll take it. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I think I... Lom Lombardia will be the hardest one. And it will depend on who's starting there. Um, yeah, I, I think he might be able to. I think he tried once in Lombardy where yep. he got like. Wasn't too bad. Tenth? So, yeah. yeah. I mean, he's gotten a few extra years in, but he needs to improve his climbing. Um, like his longer climbs, that's sort of his weakness. Um, where if you compare him to Wout, for example, Wout is a stronger climber on long climbs. Uh, so, for example, you saw last year in Liège, Wout being very good there, uh, getting on the podium. Um, so, what one can do, the other can probably do as well. Um, yeah. Imagine in a certain scenario, Van der Poel manages to win Paris-Roubaix in a couple of weeks. Will he make it a target for the 2024 season to try to win Liège and not Lombardia. necessarily for the 2024 season but it will be something that is it in his mind I think yeah I think every cyclist uh, once they've gotten and three they, they can go for four or five or try to at least there's still an important factor of the 2024 season. That's the Olympics, yeah, which we um, shouldn't forget. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um, there was a women's world tour race today in Italy, and if you saw that final, so please tell us what did you see? I saw the last 15 kilometers of that race, um, and Trek Tenafredo did what Jumbo Visma did in the opening weekend they dominated the race um, Sharon van Androoy started attacking with 50 kilometers to go um, she got a lot of help from Maria Lini if I recall correctly the, the youngster um, from Trek Alfredo. and then uh, Sharon tried again uh, with around 20 kilometers to go and the second group was just I don't know what they were thinking but there were like three or four Canyon SRAM ladies two DSM ladies um, and there was just no cohesion in the second group of course Amanda Spratt did an amazing job just jumping on every wheel um, to stop the chase but I think Van Androoy was very strong, but the chasing group did a lot of things wrong as well. Is this the start of a big road career for uh, Van Androoy? Yes. I, yeah, I think we so can too. be quite sure of that. Yeah. So she's tw she's 21 years old. She just won her first road to race. She already showed herself last year where she won the white jersey in the with the difference from yeah she will win a lot of a lot more races so to conclude that race Trek Segafredo was in control all time and Canyon Shram 
didn't use the right tactics? They were there with the numbers, but it was not only Kenny Shram, like Team DSM as well. They just attacked instead of organizing a chase. And FDG as well, they had two uh, women in that chasing group. But I think I would like to give a special mention to our young wolf, Ricarda Boyenfeld, as well. She wrote very strong. She attacked multiple times. Um, she was very active in the final of the race. So I think that's very promising for uh, for the future. Mm -hmm. um, this Sunday was really a women's cycling day because in I think in France there was a women's race as well. But Normandy. I don't know who won there. Eve, do you know? Uh, I need to check. Ah. I think it's uh, yeah yeah it's Charlie Bosset. Uh <laughs> I didn't see it. Uh, a single second of that race, I just saw the the notification on my phone from first cycling. Charlie was eight one. I uh, I had to slap myself for a moment to know <laughs> if I was sleeping or not. But I think it's her first pro win. And the her first mes the first message I got from you is she's ready for Gent Weberham. Yes. Write it Which down. Which is next week. It's not a mainstream name. Charlie Bosset is gonna get gonna win hand to wheel hand woman. She's gonna beat Lotto Kopecki in the sprint, and then your claim is over as well. <laughs> what a way to end this episode! <laughs> so we're up for a pretty busy and week of racing with uh, Classic Brugge de Panne for both men and women. Um, Idris Saxobank Classic on Friday, and then on Sunday we have Gent Wevelgem for men and women. So guys, are you ready? Yes, yeah. to bring it on. All right, Bram, the floor is yours. Well, I think we've said everything we wanted to say. That just leaves me with thanking you, our audience. Thank you for tuning into the podcast again this week. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you like our content, please consider supporting us by buying us a coffee through our Ko-Fi page, which you can find in the description. Your support helps us to continue producing great content. For those of you watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit this, the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time on the Domestique Cycling Podcast. I've got the sparse, the sickness, there's the twins in my brain.